I'm so pleased to welcome you all to this third and final installment of the Bioethics with Bigger Impact series. Um, it's a set of virtual talks emerging from a symposium in perspectives in biology and medicine, edited by myself, Elizabeth Lanfear, and Larry Churchill, um, and hosted by the Hastings Center, as well as co-sponsored by several partner organizations. So as this is our final session, I really upfront just want to express my incredible gratitude to the Hastings Center for their willingness to partner with us on bioethics with bigger impact, um, especially Mark Cardwell and Danny Passia for supporting this event series with their time and their expertise. And I am so thrilled that we have such an exciting group of speakers today, Nancy Tuana, Stephen Gardner, and Romy Operman, um, to talk with us about bioethics, climate change, and justice, among many other things. So please note, um, the speakers will be presenting content for the first uh, about 45 to 55 minutes of our time together, and then we will transition to discussion and Q&A in order to really accommodate a wide-ranging discussion. Um, so our uh, event will, we do anticipate it will run beyond the hour mark and probably about 90 minutes. So if you need to sign out prior, know that you can catch up with any missed content, again, on the Hastings Center website or Center with Public Engagement with Science YouTube page after the event. Okay. All those preliminaries out of the way, um, let me introduce uh, Dr. Romy Oberman and then hand the floor to her. So Dr. Oberman is a Mellon postdoctoral fellow at the New School for, for Social Research in New York City, um, where she will be an assistant professor starting in the fall of 2023. Dr. Operman's research centers on feminist, Africana, indigenous, and decolonial thinkers to foreground issues of racism and colonialism for environmental and climate ethics and justice and to highlight the importance of marginalized perspectives for climate futures. Specifically, her work is oriented by philosophies that trouble theories of justice inherited from liberal political philosophy and by practices of freedom operative in black ecologies, place-based movements, and struggles over land and environmental issues. Um, Romy's work has appeared in Crit Critical Philosophy of Race, CR, The New Centennial Review, March, a journal of art and strategy, The Philosopher, and Another Gaze, a feminist film journal. She's currently working on a book tentatively titled Groundings, Black Ecologies of Freedom that I'm sure we all cannot wait to read when it is out in the world. Um, I just want to note too that Dr. Operman describes philosophy, uh, the discipline of philosophy, as and I'm going to quote her, quote, a way of challenging hierarchy, domination, and socio-ecological destruction, since it allows us to fundamentally question the conditions of the present and to imagine alternative futures, end quote. I really can think of no better ethos with which to enter into a discussion aimed at unpacking the role of bioethics in the questioning of the very conditions of the present um, and imagining alternative futures when it comes to climate change and climate justice. So with that, I hand it over to you, Dr. Operman. Thanks, Elizabeth, um, and welcome, everyone. I'm really, really excited for our discussion um, today. So uh, as Elizabeth said, we're going to, um, the three of us will um, make some remarks and have a brief discussion, then turn it over to Q&A, and we'll have lots of time for Q&A. So please um, put your questions in, in the chat. Um, sorry, in the Q&A function as they arise, uh, and we should be able to get to those. Um, and we, I'll first introduce um, our first speaker, Nancy Tuana. Nancy will make some remarks, and then I will turn it over to Steve Gardner, um, and then I will make some brief remarks. Uh, so I am so delighted to introduce our first speaker, Nancy Tuana. Uh, DuPont class of 1949, Professor of Women of Philosophy and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Penn State. Among Nancy's numerous publications and achievements, I'll just mention her recent books that in different ways trace new exciting paths for philosophy. Beyond Philosophy, Nietzsche, Foucault, and Zaldua, which was co-authored co um, with Charles Scott, and Racial Climates, Ecological Indifference, and e in sorry, an eco-intersectional approach, try saying that fast three times, <laughs> out with uh, Oxford University Press um, this year. And I expect we will spend a lot of time discussing uh, racial climates, ecological indifference today, since it offers such an important approach to the entanglements of climate, ecology, and human health, uh, while tracking the complex workings of power and domination across these fields. 
Uh, in addition, Nancy is an accomplished embedded philosopher collaborating with scientists, scholars and communities to produce frameworks that can better guide climate adaptation projects and climate policy more generally. And Nancy has been an exceptional advocate, teacher, mentor, advisor to myself and so many others. And I can't wait to hear what she has to say today. Over to you, Nancy. Thanks, Romy, for the great introduction. I'm going to, I've got a PowerPoint, so I'm going to share my screen. It's really a pleasure to be talking about this very important topic. And I'm going to base my talk today on um, begin with the work of Cheryl Cox McPherson, who argued that because climate change um, is going to result in such severe impacts on health, that it's the biggest health threat in the current century. And as a result, she argues for the importance of bioethical analyses to effective responses to climate change. I agree with her position, but I want to augment it and build on it in three ways. Uh, first of all, to argue for the importance of treating human health and well being as inextricably intertwined with ecosystem and environmental health and well being. Secondly, to focus on addressing systematic oppressions as a key component of any bioethical approach to climate change. And finally, to urge for bioethicists to be embedded in decision support scientific teams to ensure that they provide the type of knowledge that not only community members want and need, but also best ensures a justice perspective. I'll focus most of my remarks in this opening on the first two points, but I'll be happy to address uh, questions about the third in the Q&A. So let me start with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, who, which recently published its Working Group 2 report on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. And that report just gives a flavor of what we're facing. They provide data showing that increased heat waves, droughts, and floods are already exceeding plants and animals' tolerance thresholds, driving mass mortalities in species such as trees and corals. These weather extremes, they explain, are occurring simultaneously, causing cascading impacts they're increasingly difficult to manage. They've exposed millions of people to acute food and water insecurity and extreme heat events have resulted in human mortality and morbidity. In addition, there are mental health challenges associated with increasing temperatures, trauma from weather and climate extreme events and loss of livelihoods and culture. In this report, there's a figure that I'm actually basing my first two criteria on. This is a figure in which they argue for the essential coupling of climate, ecosystems, and human society, arguing that you cannot untwine them, that they're essentially intertwined. But you'll notice they also emphasize at the heart of this work attention to equity and justice. And so you see my first two criteria coming directly out of this particular report and all of the scientific research that's been done in this area. To illustrate the importance of the latter, namely the attention to systemic oppression, let me start with just one of the climate change impacts and that's extreme heat. One of the reasons that I focus on extreme heat is that extreme heat events have caused more mortalities than hurricanes, floods, and tornadoes taken together. So it's one of the currently most impactful of climate change events. To illustrate um, the, the extent of extreme heat, all we need to do is look at the 2003 European heat wave, which was one of the deadliest climate related disasters in European history, which resulted in 52,000 heat related deaths 
as well as serious crop shortages due to droughts, particularly in, in Southern Europe. Now we know that there are heat islands. We know that cities are significantly warmer than urban areas and even surrounding suburban areas because of the density of the buildings and the pavements that trap and then re-emit heat. But we also are starting to look at the effect of what are called urban heat islands. And urban heat islands reflect the phenomena that particular parts of cities, within cities, there are parts that are significantly warmer than other cities. And studies like this one from the NPR have correlated those heat islands in, within cities with also the poorest parts of cities. In certain cities, in certain US cities, such as a city close to where I grew up in Oakland, California, there's a very strong correlation between those parts of the city that are in which people have the lowest level of income having the highest level of um, urban heat island effect. And those heat effects are significant. When you're in the middle of a heat wave, and we've seen a number of heat waves lately due to climate change, having uh, increased temperatures of up to almost nine degrees Fahrenheit is significant for health impacts. So we need to really pay attention to these heat waves. But to pay attention to them, we have to do so from an intersectional perspective. Because even when in a city like Chicago, where there's a weak or no correlation between um, poverty and urban heat islands, we're still seeing reverberations of mortality and health risks based on intersections of race, gender, age, as well as at times class and location. So for example, in the 1995 heat wave in Chicago where 739 people died, the majority who died were either elderly or poor, elderly often because they often already have health risks that are, um, mid, are actually intensified by the extreme heat and poor because they are less likely to either live in a house that's air conditioned or have the ability to travel to an air conditioned facility. We also know that a significantly greater percentage of those who died were men. An interesting finding that actually results from the fact that men as a whole are less likely than women to have a support system of family and friends that are, um, that'll check on them and help them if they're under distress. And finally, a disproportionate percentage of those who died were black. And in order to understand why that was the case, we really have to think about legacies of systemic oppression. I want to begin with a warning of Iris Marion Young, who in her work argued for not focusing solely on differential impacts. A lot of times work in environmental or climate justice focuses on differential impacts or what we call distributive justice. And while that's very important, Young warned us that an overfocus on differential impacts ignores the social structures and institutional contexts that often helps to determine those differential impacts. For example, in the United States, if we want to understand urban heat islands or if we want us to understand the reasons why people of color are more likely to die in extreme heat events, we need to understand the facts of racial segregation in the United States. Facts that began um, actually well before the 20th century when neighborhoods in many cities, including Northern cities, as well as Southern cities that were integrated cities were illegally uh, desegregated uh, through threats of, and in some cases, acts of violence by um, whites who lived in the neighborhood. And these are two books that start to talk about them, particularly American Apartheid. 
But that less than legal activity was underscored and exacerbated by a legal act, namely the Homeowners Loan Act of 1933 which graded certain neighborhoods as being a bad risk for mortgage support. These decisions were primarily based on the racial makeup of the neighborhoods and those that were seen as judged undesirable for mortgage support and ones that were outlined in red, why it's called redlining on this map, it's sort of pink, were primarily black neighborhoods. An assessment that led to increases in loan denials and greater refusal by insurance companies to issue policies to either businesses or individuals in those areas. And despite being banned under the Fair Housing Act of 1968, redlining practices continue to impact current urban landscapes. And we need to see this in order to ensure that our bioethical analyses are informed by these histories and their reverberations in contemporary um, geographies. For example, 75% of the neighborhoods historically redlined remain dominantly low to moderate income, of which 64% remain minority neighborhoods. This connects to uh, urban heat islands because formerly redlined districts across the US are on average more than four and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer than non-redline districts. And in some cities, the district is, the difference is as much as more than 12 and a half percent Fahrenheit, a huge impact when we're talking about health impacts. But we also have to think about what I call racial climates. Um, this is, the fact that people of color have to cope with the persistent and repeated stresses of living in racist climates, leading to a different kind of weathering, a constant wear and tear on the body caused by repeated exposures to stressors that may have bodily impacts, which shape communities, and which leave marks on the psyches. These stressors are at times linked to poverty and include exposure to chronic stress, caused by food insecurity, um, substandard housing, and greater exposure to violence. But numerous studies have supported the finding that in the US, Black disparities in mortality persist even after adjustment for socioeconomic, socioeconomic status and health behaviors. In other words, systematic racisms, apart from economic status, are a significant component of health and mortality disadvantage for Blacks in the United States. In other words, bioethics for climate justice, bioethics who study climate change, have to pay attention to what Bishop Desmond Tutu called climate apartheid, the ways in which our behavior can unintentionally Re, reanimate and exacerbate existing inequities and result in a kind of climate apartheid, in this case, climate mitigation apartheid, that results in people who are already living under the stress of racial climates being yet additionally impacted. So putting the two components that I suggest together results in what I refer to as an eco-intersectional analysis, building on the fine work of Black feminist scholars like Patricia Collins and Kimberly Crenshaw, who argued for an intersectional approach. I argue for the importance of an eco-intersectional approach, which attends to the complex intermeshings of systemic racism and environmental degradation. Not a separation between them, but understanding the many ways in which the disposability of certain types of ecosystems are often intertwined with the disposability of certain groups of people. And I'm happy to talk more about that. What it means though, is that climate justice does not 
equal human justice. And it's important that bioethics that works in the field of climate change um, it doesn't repeat this separation of environments and humans, but recognizes the importance of the inextricable intertwining of humans and the more than human world. While I won't be, have the time to develop my third criteria, I wanna advocate for the importance of embedding bioethicists in decision support scientific teams. This is something that I've been doing now for um, quite a few years in two very large NSF funded um, decision support science grants, um, the Sustainable Climate Risk Management Grant, as well as my most current Megalopolitan Coastal Transformation Hub, MOC, we call it, that works with communities in order to identify climate adaptation strategies for sea level rise and also coast flooding events that pay close attention to issues of equity and diversity and inclusion, but also are attentive to making sure that scientific research responds to the values of community members. And so with that, I will um, stop my share and um, turn it back to Romy. Great, thank you so much, um, Nancy. So much to think about there. But first I would like to uh, introduce um, our second distinguished and lovely guest, Steve Gardner. Professor of Philosophy and Ben um, Rabinowitz, uh, Endowed Professor of Human Dimensions of the Environment and the Director of Program on Ethics at the University of Washington. Steve has published more than 50 articles and book chapters. Suspicious. <laughs> Is the author and editor um, of numerous field shaping books, including A Perfect Moral Storm, The Ethics of Geoengineering, The Global Climate, Justice, Legitimacy and Governance, and most recently, the innovative and important book, Dialogues on Climate Justice, co-authored with Arthur Obst. Uh, welcome, Steve. Thank you, Romy. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm very glad that you and Nancy are here to contribute to this. I'm looking forward to the discussion. So um, unfortunately, I don't have slides because we were at least encouraged not to, which I regret not having them given the beautiful ones that uh, Nancy has put forward. So I'm just going to speak uh, to this. And what I say is going to be based on the paper that I submitted to the, the special issue that uh, inspires the series. So let me just dive in. So I think many of humanity's most serious problems are global, intergenerational, and ecological. But unfortunately, current institutions seem poorly placed to confront these kinds of problems and indeed often actively to encourage them. Now, in part, I think this institutional challenge reflects difficulties with our basic concepts and theories, which by and large were not developed for and do not seem well suited to a more global intergenerational and ecological age. Thus, as well as new and better institutions, we seem to also to need new and better concepts and theories. Now, I think bioethics is a central area where such questions arise. That's to say, given the shape of many of humanity's most serious problems, we're in need of bioethics that is global, intergenerational, and ecological in scope. Now, in some ways, this was anticipated in Potter's original definition of bioethics, which encompassed much more than questions of healthcare but instead said that bioethics should be understood as the name of a discipline combining science and philosophy with wisdom, knowledge of how to use knowledge about human survival and flourishing. Now, Potter's call didn't go completely unnoticed. Others have tried to integrate clinical and public health into a broader environmental vision through concepts such as eco-health, one health, conservation, medicine, and most recently planetary health. And some have aimed to enrich conventional bioethics itself under various 
labels, including environmental bioethics, ecological bioethics, green bioethics, and planetary health humanities. Nevertheless, experts tell us that for much of the last 50 years, the field has, quote, remained steadfastly focused on biomedicine and its issues, end of quote, with the result that environmentalized perspective on bioethics has continued to be at least overshadowed and arguably, and I quote again, almost completely unheeded, end of quote. Now, in a time of rapid global environmental change, this neglect has consequences. Environmental concerns increasingly shape other and more traditional issues and look likely to define and even swamp them. And climate change is a prime example. The threat has accumulated over the last 30 years rapidly, so that we're now at the point that dangerous climate change, as technically understood, seems inevitable and may already be on the cards. Yet while confronting climate seems destined to be central to any reasonable bioethics going forward, rather than showing leadership and helping to forestall the impending crisis, conventional bioethics has largely failed to engage and so is left mainly contribute to damage limitation, emergency management, and redress. As a result of this, the neglect of environmentalizing bioethics starts to look like a major abdication of responsibility. As two distinguished commentators recently put it, quote, like almost all working in bioethics, we have been asleep at the wheel for more than three decades, end of quote. Why has this happened? Well, one reason is probably the widespread lack of basic understanding of climate science in the, the general population, um, and in particular, the magnitude of the threat. Another thing, though, which is going to be my focus, is the tendency to underestimate the challenge. So my approach in the paper that I talk about is to recount my analysis of the climate change problem as a distinctively ethical challenge, what I call a perfect moral storm, and to explore the strengths and weaknesses of one concept of environmentalized bioethics, namely planetary health, in light of the perfect moral storm analysis, in order to see what lessons can be drawn. And to do this, I focus on the original account of planetary health from the Rockefeller Lancet Commission's report on planet uh, on planetary health. Oh, excuse me, there's a dog barking. Um, so let me start with a perfect moral storm. So the phrase perfect storm became prominent through Sebastian Younger's tale of the Andreas Gale, a fishing vessel caught at sea during the convergence of several independently powerful storms with fatal consequences for all on board. So by extension, a perfect storm involves a convergence of a number of independently harmful factors, which when they come together, pose a substantial and possibly catastrophic outcome um, on those involved. So a perfect moral storm now involves the convergence of a number of factors that challenge our ability to behave ethically, if you like throwing down the gauntlet to us as ethical agents, and especially to our moral and political systems. In the case of climate change, the converging factors or storms that the pro are that the problem is genuinely global, strongly intergenerational, crosses species boundaries, and occurs in a setting where our theories and institutions are weak. Each of these storms creates serious temptations for unethical action, and when they converge, they're mutually reinforcing and seriously compromise the prospects for ethically responsible behavior. Moreover, this convergence encourages a lurking problem of what I call moral corruption. Since ethically and defensible action is tempting for the current generation, and especially for the more affluent and generally privileged, they're likely to favor ways of thinking and talking about climate change that obscure what's really going on. Among other things, these distorted framings can disguise manifest injustice and facilitate self-deception. Now, the first of the storms is the most familiar. Climate change is genuinely a global problem. The causes and effects of climate change are spatially dispersed over the whole planet. Now, the mainstream diagnosis of the global storm, which is dominant in policy, economics, and in international relations, presents it as a traditional tragedy of the commons or prisoner's dilemma played out between nation states, where roughly speaking, the key assumptions of that model are countries are motivated by national self-interest, all would prefer not to have dangerous climate change, but each country faces strong incentives to defect from any agreement in order to free ride. 
with the result that everyone in fact defects and the commons is ruined for everybody. Unfortunately, I think this mainstream diagnosis has major shortcomings. In general, the tragedy of the commons model misrepresents the context of climate change and ways that sort of obscures the relevance of key ethical concepts, such as responsibility and justice. Most notably, the model gives the impression that all countries and all people are similarly and symmetrically placed. Everyone confronts the basic situation, has the same basic incentives, behaves in the same way, and faces the same consequences. For instance, the tragedy of the commons model encourages the idea that the key dynamic playing out in the climate context is a kind of mutually assured destruction where each country is equally engaged in self-destructive behavior that un ultimately undermines its own national interests and so results in a self-inflicted catastrophe. By contrast, the perfect moral storm analysis emphasizes the imposition by one group on another of various kinds of injustice. And so it draws attention to fundamental asymmetries and emphasizes the ways in which climate change interacts in unfortunate ways with the present global power structure. In particular, the perfect storm analysis highlights three issues. The first of these is the issue of skewed vulnerabilities, which refers to the idea that those least responsible and benefiting the least from the problem are most at threat from the negative impacts, whereas those most responsible and who benefit uh, most or much less at risk. For instance, with climate, the richer big emitters do not bear the brunt of their own behavior, which is instead disproportionately suffered by the poorer countries and populations who both contribute least to the problem and are poorly placed to hold the rich to account. This is very far from the vision of symmetrically placed actors assumed by the traditional tragedy of the commons model. Secondly, the perfect Moore storm analysis raises concerns about the wider backdrop of injustice against which all of this occurs by drawing attention to the serious injustices permeating the existing world system. This, these include, but are not limited to, the role of rich nations in structuring existing transnational institutions, pronounced global poverty and inequality, the legacy of colonialism and feudalism, and pronounced injustices involving race, class, gender, and bias against non-human species. One implication is that global environmental justice creates major threats of compound injustices, where later injustices build on earlier ones as powerful countries take further advantage of those already exploited by the current structure. The third asymmetry is temporal and brings us to the intergenerational storm. Many climate impacts, and especially the most severe, involve significant time lags, often of many decades, centuries, or even millennia. Similarly, the perfect moral storm analysis regards the intergenerational storm as a fundamental and perhaps dominant force in the climate problem. In general, the analysis highlights the threat that earlier generations will pass the buck for their behavior by imposing burdens on the future for the sake of benefits in the present. A paradigm case involves an earlier generation engaging activities which provide modest benefits to itself, but impose severe costs on later generations. The perfect moral storm analysis offers a rich account of this phenomenon by positing a distinctive kind of intergenerational collective action problem, the tyranny of the contemporary, and claiming that it constitutes a basic standing threat to human societies. Now, as well as obscuring um, the, uh, the dimensions of um, justice involved across generations, the mainstream analysis also doesn't pay any attention to the relevance of impacts on non-human nature. This is when we come to the ecological storm. In the ecological storm, um, I argue that there's a profound threat of what I call a kick the dog scenario, where one sees a chain reaction through which powerful human groups impose harms on less powerful human groups, who then pass many of them on to non-human nature. Conspicuously, the tragedy of the commons model just ignores that completely. The next storm is theoretical, 
All of this would be easy to deal with if we had robust theories and institutions in the relevant domains. But unfortunately, climate change brings together numerous issues where this is not the case. So it brings together issues of international justice, intergenerational ethics, what to do about preferences and that are contingent on what happens, or even the existence of people that's contingent on what happens, and issues of scientific uncertainty. We could add to this that we have to deal with differences, major differences in worldviews and how to respect them, including uh, in ways that raise issues of recognitional justice and reconciliation. Now, in the paper, I find that the RLC's account of planetary health is alive to the global storm and many of the various dimensions of injustice there, and indeed also emphasizes the intergenerational storm. It notes some aspects of the theoretical storm, especially in criticizing contemporary economic analyses such as cost-benefit analysis. But it is silent on the ecological storm. Nevertheless, the discussion there has been bubbling up in the planetary health community since the original report. But one background thing which I'll close with that does concern me is that in the perfect moral storm analysis, I argue that the coming together of the other storms raises this issue of moral corruption which is a distortion of the ways we think and talk about climate change, and especially distortions that reflect or encourages abuses of power by some groups for the sake of their own gain. Now, the RLC doesn't mention this worry, um, but I think it's wise to try and investigate some, some ideas of looming threats. So at the end of the paper, I highlight a few risks we might want to be aware of. One, of course, is the risk that the whole idea of environmentalized bioethics or specific instances like planetary health might be subject to hostile takeovers. They might be captured by institutions or concepts that don't really address the main features of the perfect moral storm or do so only selectively. Um, we might see with planetary health, you might say, the kinds of greenwashing that you see in lots of other parts of society. There's also a risk of the marginalization of ethics, although ethics gets a heavy emphasis in the motivation for the project and in various aspects of the view, there's a worry that it'll come to be ignored in practice and neglected as an essential area for research. And then I close by saying that there's also a risk of overreach in the concept of planetary health and other kinds of environmentalized bioethics. In planetary health in particular, the notion of health does double duty in the definition. Um, it's the core notion, or it's in the core notion, and it's also one of the three key elements of the very definition of planetary health, where the other two are equity and human well-being. This suggests that the overarching concept should be something other than planetary health, perhaps something like planetary flourishing. This has the advantage of retaining some emphasis on health as one of the key ideas, but also registers that the overall concept, planetary flourishing, is more inclusive and has a broader reach. This enables us to reach out to broader communities of inquiry um, inside academia and outside when it comes to uh, practical impacts in the real world. So in my view, the planetary health movement should embrace that revision. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Steve. That's great. And I think that um, sets up some of the things that I want to briefly mention. Um, oh, sorry, it's my doorbell going. Um, uh, in my remarks. So um, one of the main things that I try and do um, in my work, which is not focused so much on bioethics, but is um, that does concern health is to see the ways in which human and ecological health are fundamentally implicated. Um, and particularly, I think, uh, this through the concept of racist environments. So the ways in which racism and what we tend to think of as environments are not um, initially separate, but are fundamentally interwoven. Um, and so uh, forms of violence and domination against more than human um, beings and entities uh, and violence against certain groups of people are um, fundamentally implicated. And this means um, that we can't yet yeah, have one form of health 
without the other. And uh, particularly what I try and do in my work is foreground um, the importance of um, liberation for um, something like health or healing. So uh, adopting um, a range of different perspectives that are informed by say black and native feminist work on um, reproductive justice particularly, um, as well as uh, environmental violence and its links with um, violence against certain groups of women, particularly indigenous and black, um, as well as uh, the anti-colonial psychology and kind of therapeutics of Franz Fanon um, as another perspective that I think of uh, to center liberation in something like health. So once we begin to attend to the ways in which domination um, is uh, a form of wounding and violence that works across both human bodies and uh, the ecologies that they're part of, then we see the need uh, for various forms of, of struggle and liberation in order to set up the conditions for something like health and healing. And so I'm interested in um, ideas of, of health and flourishing that uh, don't take um, narrow forms confined merely to biological survival um, and uh, not, and that don't presuppose that human and ecological health are initially um, separate. So some um, examples that I've um, written or spoken about uh, include um, DDT poisoning in, uh, in different contexts in Alabama and um, Algeria. Uh, and um, I'll just say a little bit about each. So in the case of um, Alabama, I've written about a predominantly black um, community that was um, poisoned by DDT, um, uh, which was originally used, sorry, which was, which was um, made in a factory nearby. Uh, and also poisoned the um, nearby wildlife. Um, but one of the interesting things about this case is the ways in which uh, local authorities permitted that community to continue um, being um, poisoned essentially in order to um, use them as uh, um, to study the, the kind of high level of poisoning. So there's a way in which this um, community was uh, taken as a kind of test case to experiment on, to give um, knowledge of both the effects on humans and more than humans. And in fact, it was the effects um, of the DDT on uh, a local wildlife sanctuary that initially actually garnered more um, action and outrage than uh, the effects on um, the black community. And one of the things that's important about this is that it echoes um, a longer history of experimentation, medical experimentation on um, captive black people um, uh, in, and the ways in which um, devalued ecologies, but also particularly black bodies have been used as um, uh, laboratories for experimentation. And this has been um, constitutive in lots of ways for the medical establishment. Uh, for instance, I'm thinking about the kind of um, Sims as the uh, father of um, gynecology, modern gynecology, and so, and his experimentations on captive um, enslaved women. So uh, one of the important things that I want to draw attention to here is the ways in which these kind of longer logics and histories reverberate in the present um, and, uh, and how we need to take account of that in order to have something like a truly ethical bioethics. And the second thing is the ways in which um, ecological uh, that must sorry that must uh, take account of the ways in which harm to um, to more than human beings considered fungible, considered disposable, and harm to human beings considered fungible and disposable. These it reverberates against across the two, um, and they're actually interwoven. <clears throat> 
Um, and then in the case of DDT use in Algeria, um, what this is, this is quite a different context, but it's interesting for the ways in which um, it uh, evidences kind of what at a certain point in the 20th century was a, a, a global colonial imperial capitalist um, form of domination in the guise of progress and development. So the way in which DDT, which was um, a pesticide, was rolled out sometimes forcibly um, by uh, France, but also particularly by the US, um, as uh, in the guise of, um, and with the explicit aim of exterminating mosquitoes forever and therefore eradicating malaria. Um, and this instead was highly toxic um, with uh, intergenerational effects on both the land and people. And so what both of these cases testify to then is the ways in which um, the scientific medical establishment and interventions based on a narrow notion of health and well-being can serve to intensify and prolong forms of violence. <clears throat> and similarly, um, I see this in uh, the history of nuclear, um, both weapons and energy uh, from um, every stage from extraction to processing um, to storage of the waste, as well as its use in terms of, say, weapons. But I think this is something we need to be particularly aware of in um, the current push to nuclear for, of nuclear energy as a green climate solution. Um, since uh, this nuclear energy has and continues to be predicated on the sacrifice of many people and places, particularly indigenous, um, and is premised on a fantasy of containment and technological tri triumph. So again, we see um, this interwoven violence between um, people and place, uh, and um, it raises questions about what, uh, particularly in the current push of nuclear energy, what form of kind of sustainability or what image of sustainability is being pushed here? Um, and for me, I would say that this is the sustainability of one world or one form of life um, at the cost of all others. And then finally, um, recently I've been writing about the hog industry in North Carolina, uh, which brings together, again, the ways in which um, uh, racism and environments are fundamentally interwoven. Uh, and so there's been an aggressive kind of expansion um, of um, large scale indust industrial hog farming, particularly um, in this state. Uh, and it brings together a kind of whole host of um, factors, uh, including um, that affect kind of a range of people, particularly black, rural, poor, nearby residents. Um, but we see the ways in which the captivity of and the poor health of the pigs is tied to um, the detrimental effects and disregard uh, of the health and well-being and um, uh, and rights of um, local people. We might also think about the kind of massive um, uh, emissions and climate contributions of um, large-scale meat production um, uh, and the ways in which um, poor quality meat also negatively affects human health. Um, as well as the kind of poor working conditions of um, workers in the meat industry, which are often very precarious and dangerous. So these examples are just meant to kind of gesture to some of the ways in which I see um, racist environments operating with a particular emphasis on human health. And so consequently, I'm interested in expansive and alternative understandings of health and flourishing that do not begin with the assumption that ecological and human health can be separated, that value more than mere biological survival and a normatively able body-mind um, and are knowledgeable of the violent histories and present of white stream medicine and environmentalism and do not take as na natural and necessary capitalism and all the forms of domination that make up our current racist environments. And so um, particularly as I 
begun to explore um, alternative approaches to climate and bioethics, or what, what is probably outside of the bounds of um, bioethics, but uh, approaches to health uh, and tried to foreground liberation. Um, it's been particularly important to me to uh, think through feminist perspectives, particularly black feminist perspe perspectives um, for the ways that they do this uh, and attend to um, particularly the intergenerational uh, dimensions of this. So yeah, thank you. Um, I think we can, uh, I might have some questions, but we can also ask audience members. I see some hands raised. Larry, did you want to um, ask a question? Yes, um, thank you. First, I just wanted to say thank you. I thought all three of these presentations were stellar and uh, enormously informative. One of my great worries is that we're going to become numb to uh, more devastating climate news in the same way that we become numb to mass shootings. Oh, yes, another one. Hell, how many people this time? And so on. So I worry a lot about the problem of numbness. I also worry about uh, the fact that it's the next seven to eight years that are absolutely critical if the science is to be believed in terms of reversing the trends of the path we're on. And um, both Steve and, and Nancy, and I think uh, Rami by implication have talked about the need for new conceptualizations. I wanna know what kind of concept, moral or otherwise, is going to have broad enough appeal uh, that, that people will say, oh my God, we really have to do something. Uh, what are, what are the, the key ones here that you that you look toward and uh, that we need to be promoting? Stephen, you want to start and then I'll follow up? No, you don't want to start? Um, Larry, one of the things I would say is that there isn't going to be a magic wand here. There isn't going to be a concept that's going to work for everyone. One of the things I've learned in working in the domain of, of climate justice and actually climate science, is that you have to frame your message for your audiences. And there isn't just one term that works. Um, so for example, when I worked um, on the one of the big grants that located us in um, New Orleans to deal with actually the, it was because of the result of the combination of Katrina, Rita, and then the BP spill that they were starting to um, look at how they could respond to climate change. We actually couldn't talk about climate change. What we talked about was sea level rise and addressing sea level rise. We talked about flourishing. We talked about what we started doing was listening to the community members and finding out what was important to them. And then using those terms to help them make the decisions that mattered to them. And what we found out was that something like flourishing, but how they defined it was they wanted better, um, you know, money going to school systems, they wanted money going to transportation, and they wanted money going to the police force, because this is what they saw as part of the problem that people couldn't get out, there really wasn't any kind of organization. So we started talking about that type of adaptation, but they also really cared about distributed justice. They were worried about particular neighborhoods. So we could use that terminology. So I think the answer is don't look for a magic term or set of terms, work with the communities that have the problems that they're dealing with and learn what matters to them and use that in your work. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah, that was great. Um, so I agree with, with Nancy that it's a multi-dimensional problem and there's no magic bullet. Um, I suppose something I would add that's uh, distinctive about what I've been interested in working on is I, I do take the tyranny of the contemporary, the intergenerational side of the problem, very seriously. Uh, I think in that realm, we do need new concepts and we need those concepts to filter through other concepts such as 
uh, bioethics and planetary health and so on. The, the Many of our concepts now need a uh, distinctively intergenerational dimension um, and maybe need to be adapted or revised to reflect that. And then institutionally, much more controversially, and I can't defend it here, and I don't want us to get derailed by it, but I've been defending the idea of a need for what I call a global constitutional convention for future generations, which is the idea of some deliberative forum um, with a, a lot of constraints around how you do that um, to promote concern uh, for uh, future generations in the long term, and in particular to put the concerns that we already have into practice um, by giving them institutional weight. Um, Sarah Spielt, sorry if I said that one. Would you like to ask a question? Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, I'm a retired hospital chaplain and a um, and I've worked with bioethics in hospitals. And one thing that's always troubled me that I just don't hear anything about is the environmental impact of creating um, medicine and uh, delivering it, especially something like um, chemotherapeutic um, medicines and um, like who makes them and um and are the people who make them adequately protected and do we just throw everything away into the ocean and i just i just don't ever hear anybody talking about that it's a, it, it really is a burning question that i have yeah i have i actually don't know anything about it but this is a great question i'm tempted to go google now but i'm going to restrain myself um till the end but this is yeah a really important um question if anyone else knows who's here feel free to um pop your hand later but uh, i i have googled it and i and i haven't come up with anything i i don't have access to university libraries but um i haven't i haven't you know it's just really hard it's all about the important task of protecting the people who deliver chemotherapy in the in the hospital and protecting the family members of the patients and all about that, but not the actual creation of the drugs. Yeah. I, I'm not, I don't know enough to respond, but I think that there's analogous questions to ask in the domain of climate adaptation strategies and climate mitigation strategies, because some of the technologies that are being developed, um, we need to really pay attention to the safety of the people who are developing those technologies. You know, the you know, solar panels, for example, there are certain risks to um, workers who are creating the solar panels. And then Romy's attention to the push for, by some for nuclear raises the question of are we protecting the people who are working in those facilities and how are we doing that? So I think your the underlying concern of the question is one that sort of flows through the domain of um, you know sort of climate change because of some of the technologies that are being developed. So thank you for it. Yes, Elizabeth. Um, made a, a helpful um, comment, which is this is perhaps about a bigger question about medical systems and waste, but also um, about healthcare provision and maybe ideas of health that prioritizes the short term in ways that are not sensitive to the long term impact and maybe also thinking holistically. So, um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, okay. I'm interested, perhaps I can ask for both of you for how you, both of you are very kind of critical of short-term thinking and presentism. Um, have you thought about, you know, Nancy, you're, you're uh, developing a genealogical framework. Steve, you're very attentive to intergenerational justice. Um, have you thought about how those two frameworks are imbricated? Um, and uh, how do you see your work in relation to future generations? 
as well. So I both see you very much as people who are invested in um, forms of collaboration, mentorship, et cetera, with future ethicists, as well as taking seriously generational time and relations in your own work as a kind of philosophical topic. Um, so yeah, it's just an invitation to say more about that, particularly thinking about intergenerational justice and genealogy, um, if there's some crossover, and then how you see the work you're doing in relation to future um, generations. So if I can start, um, I would argue that you know, my position is that, of course, intergenerational justice is important, but it's important not to see it simply in terms of human um, futures, but to see it in terms of um, this sort of imbrication of environments and humans so that we're thinking about what's the impact of, for example, species lost, as well as what's the impact of livelihood loss for groups of people, as well as mortality and morbidity for people in the future, and that the ways in which the two go together. But, I mean, this was my point about when I invoked uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu's notion of climate apartheid. I think if we don't understand our histories and we don't understand, in Hartman's phrase, the afterlives of systemic oppression, we risk reiterating, reinforcing, and reanimating those same systems of oppression in the future. Even when we're well-intentioned and trying to develop strategies for um, addressing intergenerational justice. So I see the two as, as closely coupled. I see it as very complicated. Um, you know, as Stephen reminds us all the time, this is a very complicated, wicked problem, and it's not single faceted. And I think that we have to, we need a lot of nimbleness to do this kind of work. And we need to understand it from specific locations. You know, for example, neither is systemic racism nor the impacts of climate change the same in different geographical locations. You can't give sort of overarching responses and answers to how to solve it. It really has to be done through local um, careful attention informed by history, informed by present practices, with attention to the future. Yeah, thank you. Um, boringly, I'm gonna agree with everything that Nancy said, I think there. Uh, so let me say some other things. Uh, I think that um, if we think on expanding how we think about the intergenerational dimension, which I, as I've, I've said, I, I emphasize, I think is especially important. I think we need to push aside some of the, the usual reasons for not taking the future generation uh, or the intergenerational dimension that seriously. One is to say, well, you know, surely it's going to get so bad that we'll just have to act and it's going to get pretty bad sooner than anyone wants to acknowledge. And then that will just get over the intergenerational problem because it's coming soon. And for a long time, I've always pushed up against that, pushed back against that way of thinking, because in fact, I suspect that you know, as things get increasingly bad on the ground, we're much, we're even more likely to neglect the intergenerational side of our concerns. And so, for example, recently, and actually for a long time, I've been arguing that that's one of the threats of, of radical geoengineering technologies that try to reflect sunlight away from the earth, that we, we might be um, interested in deploying those much sooner than we should and without really investigating what the very long-term impact of those, those kinds of technologies are. So that's one way of extending the intergenerational analogy. Um, another thing I think we should be careful of, which um, is in a funny sort of way, a dimension of what Nancy said, but may, maybe not in the way that she says it, but I, I think there's an underappreciated risk that even as we try, as it were, by addressing the global storm to take very seriously, um, you know, real injustices on the ground that need to be taken seriously 
that affect people now and in the close future, especially around you know, race and indig indigeneity and class and gender and so on, there is a risk that will engage in what I call unholy alliances against the future that will try to solve or at least partially address some of our problems around those you know, issues today. But the price will be will make things worse in the future. And I think so we've got to be careful about becoming complicit in that way of thinking. And I think one could come up with some examples of what's already going on in the world that suggests that that's a really significant risk. OK, I'm going to I'm going to ask a question if that's OK. I'm going to use my um, <laughs> my convener uh, rights. I, so I'm kind of curious in thinking about um, how how those of us who work in a, on the clinical side of bioethics can learn from the planetary side and thinking right so bioethics in a in a different way right and and kind of thinking about i think in the ways in which you're all picking up on sort of a different form of bioethics um than we might think about in sort of the clinical space although i think there's you know clear and understood connections now in clinical care about the impacts of climate change and environmental, especially injustices and disparities on, on health, on sort of a, a certain kind of concept of health. Um, and I think you're really pushing us to think about health in a different way. I think it's intriguing to think about health um, in, in a kind of flourishing sense that is, and, and thinking in this longitudinal way that I think is actually going to be really Hopeful. And I'm, I'm interested in sort of the ways in that might challenge how we think about other kinds of accounts of health and clinical care. This is a very abstract question, but I guess I'm wondering about the ways in which some of the disability literature has pushed at how we understand health in clinical medical settings and how maybe a planetary account of health could open up a new and challenging way to think about the definition of you know, health or healthy um, in kind of quotes in clinical medicine. So that's sort of one piece of my question. And the other thing I'm just thinking about and put it out there, feel free to respond to whatever you, you want, if, if any of this is how to think about the primacy of um, autonomy in clinical ethics and clinical medicine. And, and so much of what I'm hearing from all three of you and the frameworks you're thinking about in terms of inter intergenerational frameworks, interconnected ecologies, um, and ethics that is often relational, right? I think that that really upends the primacy of autonomy in bioethics in ways that I wonder if we can kind of mine for some of that relational account in a clinical setting. And this may not be a topic you give much thought to given the, the domains in which you all work, but I'm wondering what, if anything, we can learn um, either about the place of autonomy in sort of the kinds of bioethics that you all do um, broadly construed um, or from a planetary account of health. So I'll begin um, an answer to one of the things that I, I think you touch on it is to start to think about health in terms of relationships and relationality, but not just relationships to other people, but our, our the form of our relationships to environment. I mean, we know well from you know clinical health that environments are crucial for our human health. You know, you put someone in a toxic environment, you know, Cancer Alley in the state of um, Louisiana, and their risks of serious health complications such as cancer increase exponentially. So part of it is to think about health in terms of relations and good relations, not just to others, but to the land. So we often think about health and add in the mental health component and think about ways to structure environments to more accommodate differences. I mean, the disability literature has really helped us see this. If we start to broaden this to the domain of climate change, we start to see the ways in which we need an even bigger scope to start to think about health. It, it needs to be in terms of this very complex infusion of environments and human choices. But nonetheless, I mean, there's an interesting way in which a different form of autonomy is, is really important to some of the work that I do. When we work with communities on climate adaptation strategies, I'm really adamant about the, the issue of 
so-called experts imposing solutions on communities. I firmly believe that communities, now mind you, they're plural and they're pluralistic. So it's not like you're gonna have a particular set, you know, value that you need to acknowledge. But I think it's really important as we move to addressing the impacts of climate change that we take the values of those individuals who are impacted in, into consideration very seriously and that we work to acknowledge them. And in that way, you have a flavor of the emphasis on autonomy in um, you know, bioethics. Now it's an expanded notion and it's, it's not an individualist notion per se, but it goes across communities. But I think working in that domain starts to give us a, an important resource for thinking about, and we already have it very much in health, you know, respecting, for example, a person's choice in terms of treatment for a particular disease and not just imposing that treatment on them. And I think we have to start, you know, using that kind of lens in, in our working with communities to deal with the impacts they're experiencing. Yeah, thanks for the, the question. Um, so I think, I, I love the way you expressed it. It was very delicately expressed. Um, and it reminded me of why it's important to express it delicately, because if it wasn't delicately expressed, it could be, you know, just seen as a straightforward, well, anything, you know, you want to do about planetary health or um, wider racial environments and so on has to be in conflict with what we understand as contemporary autonomy, and therefore it's going to be resisted. And you didn't say it that way, right? So I'm not remotely attributing it to you. But I did want to say something about that, you know, kind of what background worry that people might have. I mean, I, in general, I think it's a mistake to think um, purely of, well, all of these concepts um, as, you know, risking imposing constraints on um, autonomy or other other kinds of concepts that we have, or at least solely in that way, because they can also be seen as facilitators of improvement um, and as pushing back against constraints we already face, in particular constraints about you know, ways of living and ways of expressing things we deeply value that conventional concepts and institutions don't really allow us to express. Um, so as a small example of, of this, sometimes when I talk about the global constitutional convention idea, um, people, you know, complain, but won't that, you know, frustrate the democratic will of the people um, coming from conventional institutions? And I say, well, Part of the problem with conventional institutions is they don't allow us to express some of the voice of the people, namely the voice about, you know, future generations and intergenerational relationships more generally and how we preserve those. Conventional institutions tend to get in the way. So, in fact, you can see the new institutions of giving voice to that which is being, you know, silenced. Um, and I think that's very important when we come to think about big picture concepts like planetary health and, you know, um, I don't know, uh, Romy must have a, a great term for this, but I'm, I'm blanking on what it is, but unracialized environments, whatever the, the positive term is uh, there. Liberation ecologies is what I'm calling them at the moment. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, okay, wonderful. I have a lot to say on this, but I think it, it builds on, on both of um, your comments. I'm wondering now, Chiara, are you able to type your, sorry about this technological thing. Are you able to type your- um, Can you hear me? Question? Oh yes, I can oh. <laughs> uh, Wonderful, hi. I just wanted to start by thanking all of you. This is such a wonderful discussion. And I had a question five minutes ago that now uh, maybe has shifted because of the discussion we were just having. Um, but I guess I'll, I'll bring it back and maybe ask two questions if we don't run out of time. But um, I'm curious about, uh, so I'm starting a career in family medicine. So I've been in the world of medical school for the last four years, which has been both wonderful and particularly frustrating. And I'm curious about the kind of uh, lack of discussion about um, the for-profit industry that healthcare is 
and the ways in which that very much limits our concept of health and also what we do about health and how we promote health and what we actually are spending time caring about for our patients. And I'm very compelled, um, you know, Dr. Operman, you were talking a lot about kind of broadening this very narrow concept of health and giving it a much larger idea of what is what is flourishing, what is health. And so I'm interested in your all's thoughts about how that either does or doesn't fit into a kind of like for-profit world in general, but in particular, a um, for-profit healthcare system. And then just, yeah, maybe more broadly, like the, the overlap of um, capitalism and colonialism, which feel like kind of twinned uh, challenges here. Um, well, great questions. Thanks for those. Uh, yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't envy you. <laughs> <laughs> working in the constraints of a for-profit um, uh, healthcare system, I imagine that entails a lot of very difficult um, decisions and compromises. Uh, so at least for me in my work, I have the luxury of not, at the moment, at least being a practitioner. Um, and so uh, being able to offer kind of more... Um, yeah, visions of maybe how I think things should be. And uh, yeah, I feel like there is a fundamental tension, if not contradiction between care and flourishing, um, both ecological and um, human flourishing when they're implicated. Um, there's a fundamental contradiction, I think, between that and a, um, a capitalist world in which profit is prized over everything. Um, and sometimes I joke and it's the, it's the C word, but I mean, along with colonialism, <laughs> but um, I think we do need to say it. Uh, and at the same time, be attentive to the way in which capitalism is implicated with other forms of, of power. Um, but I think that particularly poses serious challenges. Um, and so, yeah, at least in my work, I'm interested in um, either explicitly anti-capitalist uh, or movements or kind of practices that aim at, at healing and, and different forms of life or ones that are at least on the margin um, and uh, and the ways in which those are constrained as well by what I call racist environments. So that introduces, um, I think, the, the theme of freedom, which I'm really interested in. So it's not simply that some people have, say, shorter life expectancies, um, but that the possibilities for living are fundamentally constricted um, by racist environments. And yeah, how to think colonialism and capital capitalism together. I mean, this is a huge um, debate field. Um, I think looking at particular places is helpful here, or at least from multiple, from a kind of translocal perspective. Um, in terms of what maybe we need to emphasize in our analysis uh, and resisting just collapsing one to the other, although seeing how they're implicated. So, um, yeah, that's all I'll say for now. But thank you very much for the question. Maybe we have time for one more question. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Yes, maybe what? Maybe one more. Larry, did you have your hand up still? Or, um, I mean, again, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, thank you. I, my comments will be quick. Um, there are resources for physicians and other healthcare professionals thinking about the degradation caused by the way we deliver healthcare. Uh, Andy Jamison was one of the first ones in bioethics to worry about this almost 20 years ago. But there are organizations such as Healthcare Without Harm, um, which you can tap into and learn how to be activist in terms of clinical activity. The other thing I want to mention is that um, on the intergenerational justice, which I consider an absolutely fundamental concept here, there's a wonderful book by Roman Kresnerik called The Good Ancestor. So you won't remember Kresnerik, but remember the title of the book, The Good Ancestor. It's an absolutely fabulous book. And the last thing I wanted to mention regarding the connection between human life and other forms of life, uh, I found a lot of energy in the Harvard entomologist E.O. Wilson's 
And he has a concept called biophilia, which is a kind of love we don't talk about, but which is, I think, very important for climate awareness. So thank you for a second entry into this fabulous discussion. Thank you, Larry. Um, much appreciated. Uh, I, I took notes. Um, so that's great. Uh, I think we are essentially out of time. Um, thanks to everyone for bearing with us with some technological mishaps. Um, I had a wonderful time regardless. Uh, and yeah, thanks to our speakers. Yeah, I'd, I'll just say, you know, thank you to Romy, to Nancy, to Stephen for just your your groundbreaking work and sharing it with us. Everyone should go out and get their books that are out in the world or are going to soon be out in the world. Um, and I think there's so much to learn. I, again, thanking the Hastings Center. Thanks for everyone who's here. Just want to echo really how how interconnection, relational accounts of community and autonomy, um, revisioned concepts of flourishing are also central to what we've been hearing about this afternoon um, or morning or evening, where, or wherever you are, about planetary health and responding to the harms and injustices of climate change and pursuing climate justice. Um, and how not only is this clearly within the scope of a really broadly construed bioethics, I think, but how much also clinical bioethics and healthcare can learn from ecological and environmental accounts of justice and health um, related to how we care, how we flourish, and how we pursue health and healing. Um, so I just this has been such a joy. Thank you all so much for being here. And uh, again, um, we'll, we'll sign off. And until next time, thanks so much. Thank you, it was a pleasure.